welcome to Real Gardens. Now, we haven't got any quick fixes, we've got no magical overnight transformations, but we have got real people working in their gardens at home week by week. This week, I'm murdering slugs with Adam Waterman in Yorkshire. The thought of maximum pain and retribution <laughs> makes the gardener sleep better at night. And Carol is splashing about with the skills in Devon. Oh, sorry, sir. <laughs> Dillis Wilson moved from the countryside to a Cotswold townhouse a year ago. When she first moved in, both house and garden were in ruins. She completely renovated the house in less than six months, and then she turned her endless energy to the garden. It was just a mass of brambles. Not exaggerating, they were actually over six and a half feet high. I had to clear it, and unfortunately I had a great boyfriend at the time who helped me, and he was like Rambo, sort of annihilating all these brambles. Well, it was a nightmare zone. Dillis has now reached the point where she could do with some technical advice, and perhaps a bit of extra muscle as well. A landscape gardener like Anne-Marie Powell is just what she needs. So this is it. Cool. Well, I know you think that you're living in town, but to be quite honest, this feels very country to me. It really does. Do you think so? Now, to me, it feels really towny, because I'm so used to having, like, fields and really open spaces. No, it's very countryfied with all this stone as well. It's just, like, it's beautiful. Let's get in there. So, what, so you've already split it up into very, well, four different areas, yeah, haven't you? there's four areas. There's the courtyard. Uh, which I haven't really done much with. I've just sort of graveled it just to keep it a bit cleaner. I sort of drawn, oh, I've really? drawn a plan. So this is my potager. So I want like vegetables and kitchen stuff and fruit and all that kind of, so of stuff. So you can just nip out and grab what you yeah. need. So this area here, this is um, a water garden then, this bit here, isn't yep. it? Yep, this is going to be so, the pond. So we're standing in the water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and what kind of planting do you see around here? Well, I want really big swathes of herbaceous and perennial plants. Really use the walls as a key to put, you mm. know, honeysuckle and roses and clematis and all sorts okay. of interesting things up there. I want this to be a real tranquil area. So if this is another plane that we've got here, and as far as I can see, is this, <laughs> well, I saw this lot here. But this is actually going to be a lawn. This, yes, <laughs> you, can, you can't see it now. No. This is it. The, uh, this is <laughs> a lot of moving to be done first. Well, eh? this is the last bit of stone that's left over from the house. So here you've got all these different compartments. And is this trellis? I mean, I've yep. seen that you've got trellis there. Is that how you're going to split it yeah. up? Yeah, going to put trellis up with lots of climbers up it. And then also arches. So that you just get glimpses from one, room, one sort of garden room into the next. Right. Go Dillis has together. made the basic framework of the garden by building building dry stone walls to make raised beds. But the arbour will introduce a much needed vertical feature in the garden. OK, so uprights, panels, arbour. arbour. Right, what I see is an archway here that we make into an arbour. So we've got an arch with trellis sides and a trellis back. Right. So we have a seat and it's a kind of focal point. Yeah. And then either side of the arch, we have trellis to screen it off from the other the back room as it were so there's trellis across here yeah and trellis across here but obviously we need Steps. a gap through here so, so you can a, walk a, through a, yeah <laughs> dillis has done all her building by eye back, but for yeah. a job like this we need to be exact and this horizontal cord will ensure that all the supporting posts are properly aligned what you could do is um just go back and see how it looks if this is your back trellis line because it might need to shift forwards or backwards depending no, I reckon that's about right. While I make some final adjustments to the post hole, Dillis is measuring the height of the trellis so that she can mark on every post where the bottom of each panel should fit. So that's the first post, isn't it? That's the first post. Right. And um, that's its height. With the string and the pencil marks aligned, we can make sure that all the trellis yeah. panels will fit at the same height, even yeah. though the ground is uneven. I mean, it's so important with this just to keep checking and rechecking, really. With the first upright in position, we're ready for a batch of quick drying concrete known as post mix. Yep. So you've got something to tamp it down with. Aha! Right, before you slap that cement in, Dillis, let's just make sure that it's fine. You can whack it in, actually, cos I'll change it around as we go. So put half in, then. 
When the post mix is well packed down, it's sprinkled with water before filling, tamping and sprinkling again. Perfect. How's that for saying two bags will do a whole? Anne-Marie, you've done a brilliant job there. So have you. That's the first one there. There's eight more. <laughs> Once our guide post is in place, all the others are measured and positioned from it. Uh, now we're at 36 now. And what should we be at? 37 and a half. Here. No, we need three more inches. You right? Is that? Oh, spot on. Okay, last one then. Great. The post mix will take about half an hour to set. It feels all cosy. <laughs> you do that. <laughs> <laughs> While we're waiting, we can cut the trellis to the correct width. Moment of truth. Look at that. that Perfect. Perfect. Just as well. Now it's set. It needs to go up just a tad. What we need to do is just leave a little bit of give so when the top of this arbor's on, we can just screw it, it all together. tight home. Okay. Yep. That's that's bitten. Yep. So now we can do the exciting bit. The top, yes. Yeah. Lift. Lift. Slot it in there. Ready? I'm going to yes. push. Yeah, done it. Yes. Excellent. That's good. <sighs> With the last couple of trellis panels to screw in, we're on the home stretch. Yep. So that. That is bloody good. God, doesn't that make a difference? That's really good. <laughs> mm, always like a knob. <laughs> oh, what did you make of it, though? Well, I think once it's clothed with clematis and roses and stuff like that, it'll be absolutely perfect. You need someone to share it with, really, now, don't you? So I think you should be wear working on that before I see you next time. This should be a snogging seat, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't fancy you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Until a few years ago, Adam Waterman would get home at 5am after a night of clubbing. But nowadays, that's the time he gets up and heads off for his three allotments, just 100 yards from his Yorkshire home. Adam is now a committed organic gardener. So what led him to this complete change of lifestyle? I enjoy feeding myself and my children and my wife on the food that we have produced. I garden organically because I don't see the reason to not garden organically. It seems logical, if you're going to grow food to eat, to not cover it with pesticides and herbicides and all the rest of it. It seems a far better idea to work with nature rather than against nature. Yeah. As an organic gardener myself, I'm curious to know just how Adam deals with pest control. It is. Is this where you grow your carrots? Well, not, not just carrots. Anything that's affected by carrot fly, which is salsify, parsnips, carrots, parsley. You use this netting and the carrot fly physically can't physically, get through? Physically, yeah, it's a barrier method. But the water and the air can? Yep, yep. Right. Yeah. And, the, and the supports are just... just, just, just al yeah, just alkathene pipe. You, you can buy it from builders' yards or yeah. any DIY type place. It's quite cheap. I use at home a fleece which I just lay over the carrots yeah. and fix at the corners. And as the carrots grow, they push it up. Right. Well, I mean, I do that on my brassicas, as you can see, oh, the, yeah. for cabbage whitefly. But right. again, it's a barrier method. So why don't you use that on the brassicas? Because that's relatively expensive in that size of width. Right. <laughs> but I mean, other than carrot fly and mm -hmm. cabbage white. Yeah. There's nothing else that you have to be too specific about, is there? Well, things like strawberries. I've got a, a problem with strawberries and slugs. Where are your strawberries? Just over there. Just over there. Let's have a look at those. Yeah, I hadn't seen these before. It, yeah, these are the second year they've been in. They were in last year. These are a bit late. It's a variety that lightens a bit. But I can see what you mean about slug damage. So you didn't watch me the other day say, use grit. I did watch. You... <laughs> but didn't listen. No, but it's, it's quite an expensive way of, of, of dealing with a problem. But it is expensive. Yeah. The only thing is it works mm -hmm. and it lasts. But anyway, you've used hay and there are slugs underneath there. Doing yep. their worst. So what are we going to do? There's too many for the knife, so I'm calling in reinforcements. 
Adam is going to use slug-destroying nematodes to protect his strawberries. These are microscopic worms which tunnel underground and invade the slugs' bodies. I do like the way these work. You know, they burrow in and then destroy the slug from the inside. Just like they do my strawberries. Yeah, it's a, you know, the thought of maximum pain and retribution <laughs> makes the gardener sleep better at night. Yeah. The nematodes are advertised in the gardening press and can be bought by mail order. Each pack contains 12 million parasitic worms in a clay base. Just add them to water to activate them, and they'll make up to 50 litres of solution. This will cover about 40 square metres. Unlike some chemicals, they are completely harmless to humans. I don't think that this is practical over a whole allotment. No. Yeah. You'd be fighting a losing battle on that. But as I say, for a few weeks, it's all... It would, I mean, it would be good inside the polytunnel. I don't have problems with slugs in the polytunnel. Oh, well, so you don't I, have, need I have other problems in do my body tunnel. I do. All right, let's go and look at that. Okay. We've done this. Well, it doesn't look like you've got many problems. Everything's grown like mad since I came. The biggest threat to Adam's vegetables come from green fly, or aphids. There aren't any in the polytunnel at the moment, but they could fly in at any time. The organic approach to the problem is to encourage aphid predators, such as ladybirds and lacewings, to take up residence. So Adam has bought some predator hotels. I've got a ladybird house. <laughs> is this really necessary? Uh, the concept being that if you introduce ladybirds and there's no aphids in here at the time, then you put a little bit of ladybird food in there. You could argue if there's no aphids, you don't need you, any ladybirds. You could, but I don't want all the ladybirds to go in the meantime. So, and, and it's yellow. The yellow, the yellow is significant. Yeah, the yellow and tracks. And that's the food, and that's you don't know food. what's in there. Do no they tell idea. you what's in there? No. Ladybird egg and chips. Well, I, mean, I certainly yeah. don't want to be a downer on it, no. because it's better than any kind of spray. Oh, oh yeah. Now, lace wings. Now, this is a lace wing house. <laughs> <laughs> Very sweet, that. With yeah. straw inside. Straw inside. This is pheromone. I don't know how they obtain this. And oh, that's, that's lacewing larvae. So you just pop that in there and then just stick that on a, a shelf or, or whatever. So you put those in there. Yeah, yeah. It's just stick little... some essence of Mel Gibson or whatever yeah, it is yeah, that turns yeah, them on. Yeah. yeah. And um, they come flocking in. They, they come flocking in and then they eat my aphids. Adam's polytunnel is now armed with organic defenders against problem pests. Back at home, Adam has a collection of acid-loving plants, which we dug up on my last visit, and he wants to make a new bed for them. Ah, it's a bit scruffy. It's, it's a veritable mess, Mr. Don. The problem is that rhododendrons and heathers and other ericaceous plants need acid soil, and Adam's soil is not quite acid enough. There's absolutely no point in making an ericaceous bed. No. Unless your soil is acidic. No. I've so. got my trusty kit. The last time I did one of these was in Annabelle's garden last year. I watched it closely. Did you? Yeah. Oh, well, you knew how to do it. You do it. <laughs> Using the chemical reagents supplied with the kit, we simply add a soil sample and a small amount of tap water. Once this is all mixed up, it's just a matter of comparing the colour with the guide to see how acid or alkaline the soil is. Most of it's come out. 6.5? Yeah. So it's not an acidic soil? No. No. So to speak? No. Right. My advice would be... Don't bother. Forget the idea. <laughs> Plant things that like a neutral soil. And it's my garden. So no. <laughs> Although I would have preferred to scrap all of Adam's old plants, he just couldn't bear to lose them. So, to give them a fighting chance, we're acidifying the soil the organic way by digging in some well-rotted manure. We're also adding in some pine needles that Adam collected from a local wood. Okay, I'm not too bothered about it being perfect. That's just as well, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All of these plants have been around for a while, and some of them are getting quite pot-bound. Some of them are also suffering from chlorosis, which is the yellowing caused by too much lime in the soil. But with the help of a pail of water and a pine needle mulch, we can only hope for a full recovery. Hi. Hello, your family's back. Hordes of girls. Oh, careful. Yeah, it looks like rather it. good, that. Not it's bad. It looks a lot neater. Neat, tidy, front garden. Looks nice, yes. Doesn't it? You're going to come inside and help me decorate now? 
I'll come inside, but I'm not going to help you decorate. I've got more needs inside the house than Careful. the allotment. Careful. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> After the break, Carol Klein is in Devon, planting up a pond to attract wildlife. Welcome back. Now, I think tomatoes are one of the most satisfying all crops to grow. If you've grown them before, you'll know all this. But if it's the first time, it's really important that you take the laterals out. Now, the laterals are the growth that comes at 45 degrees between the main stem and the leaves. They grow very strongly, and it can seem a bit radical if you've let them get too big, but don't be frightened. Take them out and then train the plant as a cordon up some sort of support. Adam's using twine and then twisting it round it as it grows. I tend to use a cane and tie it to it, but it doesn't matter what. It does need support because tomatoes can get really heavy as they get mature. Very, very important to keep tomatoes well watered. At least once a week, give them a really good soaking and probably every other day if the weather's at all warm. They need a bit of feed, high potash. I use liquid seaweed. But other than that, dead easy. Now, Carol Klein is back in Devon with Chris and Bill Skeels and helping them with their pond. Eight years ago, Essex couple Chris and Bill Skeels gave up their nine to five jobs and went back to the land in North Devon, reinventing themselves as small time farmers. Recently, they turned their attention to the garden, which is 10 times the size of the one that they had back in South End and gives them the scope for projects that they could only dream of before. Latest on their wish list is a large pond, already dug and lined by Bill, and waiting to be brought to life. All this wildlife that's out there, we don't get to see it. And I just think if we build something that's in harmony with our surroundings, they're all going to go, we'll come and live here, and then we get the pleasure because we're going to see them. And that's really what this pond's about. Looks like hard work. It certainly is hard work. <laughs> yeah, what have you done, Bill? It's just, it's brilliant. It's a major earthworks, isn't it? We, we had a problem with, with the clay because there's so many stones sticking through. We put inch and a half screed of cement and sand in. Then the, what, the real carpet, concrete? Real concrete, inch and a half all over. Yeah. Then the lounge carpet went in. You got any carpet left indoors? None at all, none <laughs> at all. <laughs> So right. we've, we've done the job five times. Yeah. Bill's made a wide shelf just below the final water level for plants which like their roots in shallow water. In two places, he's built low walls where he wants to make beds for these marginal plants. I'm going to put another liner inside, yeah. so then the soil will go back on top the liner. Right. And you've done one already? Yeah. It's just your demonstration model, is it? Yeah, that's the one I let Chris do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that. laughs> They could put plants in pots straight onto the shelf but these enclosed beds will give the plants a chance to spread more naturally. Let's give you a hand with this liner, then. This is the same stuff you've used for lining your ponds? It's identical, yes. Yeah. Black side up black for side this? Up. Not backside. <laughs> no, black side yeah. up. Does it matter if it overhangs, Bill? No, I'll, I'll cut that off afterwards. All we need to do is just push it down onto, onto the bed. This is a good idea, this. That'll be fine. And the water will just push it out anyway? Yes. So you're going to fill all this with soil? Just ordinary topsoil. Because the problem is sometimes soil's got fertiliser in and that just encourages algae and, you know, all that horrible blanket weed. And, right. and, um, no, just ordinary topsoil, no oh, fertilisers whatsoever. I'll, I'll believe okay. you, I'll believe you. <laughs> but would you mind if I leave you to it? No, fine. Hiya, Chris. Hi. You've been playing with Bill? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> we've both been on the shelf. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what have you got in store for us, then? All different plants for different places. Yeah, and you've got all, all, all three things that you really need. You've mm. got stuff to grow on your margins for insects to climb in and out and clothe the edge of your pond, and you've got oxygenators, haven't you? Yeah. Several different kinds. And you've got some lilies. It's really important to have things that float about on the surface of the pond. You know, if you have a completely open surface, you encourage blanket weed and stuff. And also, little creatures can hide underneath it. So what should we start off with? Because Bill's still doing these margins. What if we do the oxygenators, because then we'll be out of his way? Yeah, all right, and I love chucking stuff in, don't <laughs> All ponds need these oxygenating plants, which sit at the bottom. 
They take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. They also absorb the nutrients, which would otherwise encourage the growth of unsightly blanket weed. Let's have a go at some of these then, shall we? Yeah. I've got some stones yeah. and some string. Because if you just chuck them in as they are, they'll just float around on the surface. Oh, and it'll take them ages to sink. Will it stay on there, though? Well, we'll soon find out. Go on, you do it. Uh. Ready, steady, go! Oh, sorry, Phil. <laughs> A pond this size needs at least half a dozen bunches of oxygenating plants and a selection of marginals, which are both decorative and good for wildlife. OK, that's fine. Yeah. All right. I think that's enough, don't you? I should think so. Yeah. It's only going to grow, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> You're only going to have to pull it out. So, shall we all have a go at this, then? Yeah. I like this. This is just yellow flag iris, isn't it? Yeah, oops. That's the oh. common one. Yeah. Because this is a native plant, it's going to attract more wildlife than, you know, your ornamentals. I mean, ornamental plants are smashing and they'll still attract butterflies and pollinating insects. But um, as many native plants as you can have. Yeah, and that's why you get more wildlife. Yeah. Well, that's what you want, isn't it? Well, that's the idea of it. That who's tin you're planting is a really lovely plant. It's not native, but it's perfect right in the water, on the edge, or even in a sort of damp border. And it's got a very invasive root system, but you smell it. Oh. So the roots sort of smell of orange peel, don't they? Well, yeah, but what a shame. Because the flowers don't. <laughs> no. But it's all right when you're planting it anyway, oh. isn't it? I have to keep coming up giving it a poke so it smells nice. Yeah, you'll have to keep coming up and dividing it, won't you? Probably. I'm going to plant this Santadisha right in its pot because it's in one of these special pots with loads of holes that you can just drop down into the water and plonk onto your marginal shelf. You wouldn't even need any soil if you if you put it outside there. This one, Crowborough, is completely hardy. But that's the only one that is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. When the pond is full, all these plants will be standing in about six inches of water. When the water level rises, the parrot's feather will float on the surface and the pond will be ready for the local wildlife. I think that's a really good start. Really think, smashing. Yeah, I think the only thing you need to do is make sure this soil doesn't float away by just plonking some gravel up. We've that got that gravel water. from up there, haven't we? We can yeah. use that if we wash it. Yeah, that'd be perfect. And I can't wait to see the pond filled up next time. <laughs> really looking forward to it. That's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.